Leonard, the so-called fine-tuning of our universe is a problem that everyone says demands explanation. How could it be everything just so to enable us to exist? You, you have this very uh, compact and, and very dense phrase that you use to explain it. It goes something like, uh, uh, we, we need a landscape of possibilities that is populated by a megaverse of actualities. Now, I really want you to explain that to me. Okay, so what it means. First of all, what does the landscape mean? The landscape doesn't mean the real world. It doesn't mean the universe that's out there. It means the collection of possibilities. It means the collection of all possible blueprints for a universe. The word was taken from the biologists. The biologists speak about the landscape of biological designs. By that, they don't mean all the biological objects. They mean all the possibilities for rearranging DNA, all the possibilities. That's what the landscape is. But possibilities by themselves are not enough. We need to create those objects. It's like having a whole bunch of blueprints for houses, but you have to have something to build the houses. Uh, what was it in biology? Well, it was Darwinian evolution acting on a bunch of carbon, oxygen, and so forth, eventually filled out this enormous uh, landscape of possibilities and created a biosphere of very, very great diversity. So what is the analog in the physical exactly. world? Exactly. In the, in the physical world, assuming that my view is right, the landscape That's of why possibilities... Yes, of course. <laughs> the landscape of possibilities is all of the diversity that's inherent in string theory. String theory has components which are in many respects similar to DNA, and you can rearrange them at very, very microscopic distances in a huge variety of ways. That creates a landscape of possibilities. And each one of those possibilities could yield different laws of very physics. Very different laws. Combinations of, of laws. Some, some of these worlds would have electrons, some of them wouldn't have electrons, and so forth. But we also need whatever it takes to bring these possibilities into reality just in the same way that blueprints, that builders have to come and build the houses uh, that the blueprints describe. That we believe, or at least some fraction of physicists believe, was what this inflationary cosmology did. The very, very rapid expansion in the beginning of the universe created pockets, pockets of this type, pockets of that type, pockets of another type, much in the way that Darwinian evolution created all of the branches of life and filled it all out. So the expectation then is that the universe is extremely big, much bigger than we can see, and full of all different kinds of environments. Yeah, and some would describe each of the separate pieces of the whole universe, depends how you use the term, as a pocket universe or a bubble right. universe squeezed off from the rest with its own separate exactly. laws created by this inflation, which may have ended in our pocket right. universe, but continues on in others and, and making continues lots on of in others. others and continues to bubble and froth and create more and more and more environments. And which, which kind of environment do we live in? Well, we live in one of those environments in which life is possible. There's nothing surprising about that. So that's the view that at least some fraction, and I would say probably by now, the majority of theoretical physicists are moving now, in. Now, this is the so-called anthropic principle, whether you like the name or not. It basically says that, that uh, as, as human beings, we have to be in an environment in which it is conducive for human beings right. to exist. Okay. It sounds uh, trivial, tautological, silly, when you first think about it, but as you use it, 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 it has greater explanatory power. It has explanatory power, but uh, it, it, is, it does sound trivial. We live where we live because we couldn't live anywhere else. Right. But there's more to it than that. It says whatever the controlling equations of physics are, whatever the controlling mathematics, uh, rules of nature are, it permits enormous diversity. That's not obvious that the equations of physics should permit right. this enormous diversity. And it also requires a mechanism to bring it into existence. And that's not trivial. Uh, we do have such mechanisms, mathematical mechanisms, and we do have a mathematics which produces this diversity. 
So, no, it is not trivial. We could have imagined a mathematics which just gives rise to two or three different possibilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the world might consist of separate regions, one, two, or three. And really you have two different kinds of mathematics. You have in mathematics of string theory at the most fundamental level, and you have the mathematics of inflation, chaotic inflation, exactly. and eternally chaotic right. inflation at the other level, right. both of which are working. That's right. And the analog in the biological world would be the mathematics of a DNA molecule, mm -hmm. all the different possibilities, the way to rearrange it. Which is the string theory. Analogy. Which is the string theory. And the other mathematics would be the mathematics of Darwinian evolution. How, uh, how species branch, how they create new species and so forth, and how eventually a big tree of life forms. That's and the that other part tree of it. is the in chaotic inflation of the, of, of the macroscopic level. Exactly. Okay, I mean, that, that sort of sounds reasonable, I'm sitting here in your living room. <laughs> um, why the controversy? Let, let, well, let's talk about the different yeah. kinds of controversy. Let's talk about in your field among theoretical physics, because I've talked to some, and uh, many of them you know, would say, would think about it, and they say it's too soon to give up. Okay. Why, why, yeah. do you, why do you give up? Yeah. Um, Why do you give up trying to find the ultimate solution, the one kind right. of system that will explain it all and will understand? The history of physics has always been this way. We've always looked for the one way to do it. Sometimes we've had trouble, but eventually we'll find it, and we do find it. And anybody who wants to devolve into the anthropic reasoning is giving up. Of course. Now you're, answer, you're asking, of course, a psychological question. <laughs> and I don't have a degree in psychology, so I will do the best to try to answer it as I can. You have to go back a dozen years or so to what physicists thought about these anthropic ideas. They thought of them as being religious. They thought of them as being the statement, the world is the way it is because God made it so that people could exist. Physicists don't like to explain things that way. They want uh, hard-nosed equations, they want hard-nosed explanations based on the laws of science and so forth. So they were very, very, I would almost say angry. There was almost an anger at this idea that the universe was somehow made for us to live in. Um, that how shall I call it, that um, mindset was the mindset about the anthropic principle, let us say, 10, 12 years ago. It just rankled against physicists' um, uh, objectivity to introduce something as personal as saying the world was made for us to exist in and live in. But as time went on, they found it less and less and less possible to explain the world as we see it. And new kinds of explanations evolved, which were not religious in the least. They depended on this enormous diversity, but they had in the back of their mind always that there was some, uh, some supernatural aspect to it. The other thing was um, ambition. I don't mean personal ambition. I mean the ambition of the field. The ambition of the field was to explain every single fact of nature, the constants of nature, the particles of nature. The hope was that we would be able to use our equations to explain every single feature of nature. And that just conflicted with the idea that nature could be enormously diverse. It is almost as if at one time biologists had the ambition to predict exactly what a human being was like from the microscopic laws of chemistry. Well, that didn't happen. That's not the way it worked. A human being could have had three ears, he could have had two noses, all kinds of differences uh, could have been inherent in the DNA. And the biologists, had they had that ambition, would have been frustrated. Some of them might have even gotten angry and said, oh, it can't be that way. Uh, that's kind of what happened. The ambition of physics to explain everything uniquely by some fundamental mathematical beautiful laws, elegant laws, got frustrated. And so for a period of time, physicists reject, not, didn't reject, they resisted this. I would say that by now, 
the, uh, there's been a reversal of fortune. Most physicists recognize if you were to hold a gun to their head and say, explain to me the fine tunings of nature, and if you don't give me the right explanation, I'm going to pull the trigger. Or you're going to say, oh. God did it. <laughs> that would be worse. That'd be a worse. Oh, that'd be worse. <laughs> <laughs> They would hem and they would haw and they would hem and they would haw and then they would say, oh, must be the multiverse and, uh, and the landscape of string theory because there is no other explanation. So there's been a reversal of fortune. On the other hand, we're all unhappy that our ambitions have been frustrated. So some people, myself included incidentally, would say it's too early to give up the, uh, the ambition but it's not too early to start to think about the other possibilities. And in fact, the other possibilities, namely this grand anthropic uh, multiverse landscape picture, that one seems to be the way that most physicists are going now. Like it or not, and they don't. <laughs>